get the record. Okay. Hand over to Candace Karasan. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, very excited to get in the Facebook notification now, too. Welcome, everyone on Facebook, everyone joining us on Zoom. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you here on what is a very uh, important day uh, for the trajectory of our country and, and someone who's really helped mold that, uh, of course, uh, John Lewis. And I think he has served as a mentor for many of us on this call, for many of our fellow uh, Americans back stateside and abroad and for our organization as a whole. So thank you, no matter where you are, uh, for tuning in today and joining us for this special event uh, where we commemorate, commemorate his lifetime, but also look ahead and talk about what we are doing to make a difference in Georgia in 2022. And I think that's a nice segue into a little bit about Democrats Abroad. Uh, so if you, perhaps you know our organization, perhaps this is your first event with Democrats Abroad, uh, we're glad to have you here. You might be asking yourself, what are we exactly? Uh, we are the largest organization of US citizens living overseas. And we are also a part of the Democratic Party. But besides what we are, I wanna talk about what we do. And what we do is we make a difference in US elections all across the country. And we're gonna do it again in 2022. And that is the motto for this event uh, today. So a little bit about what, how we did this, right? 2020 happened, people were voting up and down the ballot in states like Georgia. We ended up making the difference, we being overseas voters, uh, made the difference in Arizona, in Georgia, and we're gonna do it again this year with your help. Uh, one of the special initiatives that we're launching this year to bring the elections closer to you as voters living abroad is a concept called state teams. Uh, so you may have seen on the invitation for today, or if you're tuning in on Facebook, you're probably seeing Georgia State Team. And the idea behind this is that we bring together Georgians all around the world uh, so that you can get events like this today, uh, so that you can get better information about how to vote from abroad in the state of Georgia, and really just to build community. So it's it's been nice seeing different uh, counties I pop up in the chat box, I think. We all remember them all too well from that November 2020 election night uh, as the ballots were coming in and DeKalb County was being called on CNN. Uh, but in that vein, just very excited to see people from all around the world and from all parts of Georgia on today's call. Before we dive in, I did just want to give a few shout outs uh, to our organizers, uh, particularly Evelyn, uh, who serves as the Georgia State Team Lead. Um, Jennifer von Estorf, who is our state teams coordinator, so she's focusing on all of the battleground states. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Karen, who is off camera, but making sure everything runs smoothly on the tech side. Uh, and I'd also like to extend my gratitude to all of the speakers joining us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to say a little bit more about state teams and, and what's ahead with today's event. Jennifer? Great. Thanks so much, Candice. Like Candace said, the 2021 um, races in Georgia, the Senate races especially, were really a pivotal moment for Democrats abroad. For the first time, we as an organization focused our entire energy on these critical state races. And this shift really opened the door for what's become our Democrats abroad state teams. And our hope is with these, with these teams that we can really encourage overseas voters to be more engaged with what's going on in their voting states and ensure that they turn out to vote not only in federal elections, but also in state and local elections. Another part of our mission is to represent the interests of our overseas voters in these key states and to work to make sure that voting from abroad is simpler and it's more accessible through targeted voter assistance and through legislation, thus reducing the obstacles to voting. One further aspect of our work is building bridges between our overseas voters and state democratic parties and other groups on the ground. Raising awareness that voters are eligible to cast their ballots from outside the US is critical to finding new voters. Fewer than 8% of voters abroad participated in the 2020 elections. So the potential for finding new voters is vast. With the help of people on the ground to spread the word and to send any Georgians that you know to Democrats abroad and vote from abroad, we can help to strengthen the blue wave washing over Georgia and continue to provide the margin of victory for races, both up and down the ballot. 
I'd like to thank our Georgians Abroad State team for all of their work these past months and for their commitment to getting out the vote amongst voters living abroad. Thank you as well to the Global Black Caucus and the Global Youth Caucus for co-hosting the event today. And finally, a huge thank you to our three guest speakers for taking time to connect with Georgians across the globe and for all the amazing work that you're doing on the ground to turn Georgia blue. We look forward to celebrating the life of John Lewis, Lewis together today. And as he said it best, nothing can stop the power of a committed and determined people to make a difference in our society. We really look forward to making a difference together in the years to come. And with that, I'll hand over to the Global Black Caucus Chair, Lee Donald Moore, to help us honor John Lewis. Hi, everybody, and welcome all around the world. While the GBC is recognizing and celebrating small victories for the big win in 2022, we are recognizing and celebrating African-American history and history in the making during Black History Month. While we, let me, let me rephrase this because it's actually really, really such a great event that you all are putting together. And while we speak about uh, John Lewis on this special day today, let's all just take a moment and think of all the battles that he did, of all the rights that he won, of the America he molded, not just for African-Americans, but for all Americans. An attack on African-American voting rights is an attack on all Americans. I chose a little video um, to present you, and it's really, really hard to find a short five-minute video to depict the greatness of John Lewis, but I found one. And I found one which is narrated by a British broadcasting station. So why a British broadcasting station? Well, we as Americans living abroad, we have a different perspective. And I believe that they captured the essence of John Lewis's work, commitment, blood, sweat, and tears to the point. So without any further ado, have fun watching the video. Thank you very much. alongside John Lewis. The son of sharecroppers, he began protesting when just 20 years old, there on the march on Washington, on the buses in Birmingham, and on that bridge in Selma. And generations from now, when parents teach their children what is meant by courage, the story of John Lewis will come to mind. An American who knew that change could not wait for some other person or some other time. Lewis was born in 1940 in rural Alabama, when life in the South was dictated by Jim Crow laws which enforced racial segregation. When he started college in Nashville, the movement to end all that was beginning, and Lewis joined the sit-ins, when activists would seat themselves at white-only lunch counters in protest at segregation. Faced with beatings, they would never retaliate. I was sitting there demanding a God-given right and my soul became satisfied that I was right in what I was doing. I could no longer be satisfied. I go along with an evil system. In 1961, he became one of the original 13 Freedom Riders, traveling on Greyhound buses through the South to force the desegregation of public transport. I felt good. I felt happy. I felt liberated. I was like a soldier in a nonviolent army. Lewis was beaten in North Carolina, knocked unconscious in Alabama, and jailed in Mississippi. Such attacks in the face of peaceful protest shocked the world and forced Americans to confront the true nature and extent of racism in their nation. At 23, he helped organize the March on Washington, where Dr. King preached his American dream. Spoke as well. He was until now the only surviving speaker from that day. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. Sue Lewis and others would turn to voting rights, trying to help African Americans to register when so many barriers were placed in their way. They planned to march from Selma to Montgomery in Alabama. Yet they were met on the Edmund Pettus Bridge by state troopers who charged at them. And who was at the front line, taking yet another beating for his cause? They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, bull whips, 
trapping us with horses. This is me here. 50 years later, Lewis returned in a different time with a very different president. If someone had told me when we were crossing this bridge that one day I would be back here introducing the first African-American president, I would have said, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, you don't know what you're talking about. By then, Lewis had moved on from his street fighting days, serving in Congress for more than 30 years. His causes remained consistent. Even his methods were the same. In 2016, angered by Congress's inability to enact gun reform, he staged a sit-in on the House floor. How many more mothers, how many more fathers need to shed tears of grief? Never fearful of speaking his mind, Lewis boycotted the inauguration of George W. Bush and Donald Trump. For him, they were two Republican presidents bookending a leader who meant far more, a black U.S. president. And so it was Lewis who was the first to embrace Barack Obama as he walked out to make history in 2009. Why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. One thing with Barack Obama, he's not a, a victim of the scars and the stains of racism. He, you are. He, uh, we are. Those of us who grew up in America, those of us who grew up in, in, in the 40s and the 50s, who tasted the bitter fruits of segregation and racial discrimination, we bear those scars. We are victims. Why is it an advantage for him perhaps not to bear those scars? Well, Barack Obama is a, is a compositor. Of, of the best of America. He, uh, he, uh, he is free with his background and with his makeup. He's, he never experienced segregation and racial discrimination. He never saw those signs at water fountains, at bus station and train station. He never had to go to the back of the bus. In December 2019, Lewis revealed his latest, most deadly battle, pancreatic cancer. It was ultimately the fight he never won. But think of the battles he did, of the rights he won, of the America he molded. Another civil rights foot soldier has fallen. But the path John Lewis trod is one rich with victories and lessons for America's future. Yes. So again, think about the battles he has done, won, and fought for all of us here today. Just let that sink in a little bit, and I'll pass the torch over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jazz. I'm the next speaker, right? Or Hello? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Evelyn Riera. Uh, I'm the team lead for the Georgia State team. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jazz, for this wonderful introduction. And I think um, John Lewis is really an inspiration for us. And, and I think that voting he said it was uh, almost sacred. And I truly believe that. And to honor him, I think we have to uh, try to vote, try to get other people to vote and uh, defend our democracy. Um, as a team, we want to do everything possible to increase awareness about overseas voting, both abroad and in the US. Turnout among overseas voters, as you've heard before, is very low. Depending on the statistic, 80 to 90% of overseas voters do not vote. Yes, that is 80 to 90% overseas voters do not vote. Of course, I dream of the day that we say that 80 to 90% vote. The November 2020 election and the January 2021 runoffs in Georgia demonstrated that increasing turnout among overseas voters 
can make a great difference. In November 2020, Georgia overseas voters cast about 18,000 ballots, far exceeding Biden's 12,000 plus margin of victory in Georgia. Without the 18,000 overseas votes, Biden would not have won Georgia. To educate and mobilize voters, we want to reach out to different actors and organizations of interest, both political and non-political, to raise awareness in the US and abroad. We want to organize events and find and pursue usual and unusual creative ways to educate and mobilize non-voters, registered voters, everybody. There are lots of ways that you can contribute. You can join phone banking campaigns. You can join our Georgia state team. If you're not from Georgia, you can join another state team. Um, there's just a lot of things that you can do, small or big. Uh, you can write letters to the editor to a local newspaper back home, for example, just to make people aware that they're that people abroad can vote. Uh, just because they're abroad uh, doesn't mean they don't have that right anymore. Okay, um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Sarah Riggs Amico. First of all, I would like to extend a big thank you to Sarah for reaching out to Democrats Abroad Italy and offering to help. I think that's absolutely amazing. A big thank you also to DA Italy for forwarding Sarah's email to the state teams. Sarah Riggs Amico is a business executive, political leader, and founder of Rediscovering Our American Dream, a mission-driven media company that is building the largest visual archive ever created to define, document, and defend the American dream. Sarah segged into politics in 2018 after she was recruited to run for Lieutenant Governor of Georgia. After winning the Democratic primary, Sarah joined forces with Stacey Abrams, running on a platform that included expanding affordable health care, investments in education, tackling income inequality, and creating economic opportunities for all Georgians. Both candidates were endorsed by national figures, including President Obama and the late Congressman John Lewis. Passionate about the core issues that impact our daily lives, Sarah is a fierce advocate for economic just, justice and strongly supports equal rights, LGBTQ plus protections, health care, criminal justice reform, and universal health care. She uses her voice to stand up for progressive values and her grassroots perseverance helped flip Georgia blue. She's currently executive chairperson of Jack Cooper, her family's trucking and logistics company. Um, she holds a BA from Washington and Lee University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. I'll hand over to Sarah now. Thank you so much, Evelyn. And thank you, everyone. Evelyn, can you guys hear me? I can hear you very well. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. Um, first, I think I owe all of you a thank you. The, uh, the results in Georgia in 2021 delivering 16 electoral college votes for Kamala Harris and Joe Biden first time taking state for Democrats in a presidential election since 1992, um, as well as winning not one, but two U.S. Senate seats in January of 21, really show the power of what Democrats abroad can do. Uh, and as Evelyn mentioned, with a margin of a little over 11,000 votes for President Biden in Georgia, the 30,000 Democrats registered to vote in Georgia who live abroad uh, really can be critical again in 2022. To do a couple of things today, um, I have to tell you the story uh, about the day that I met John Lewis and actually my oldest daughter was with me. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the electoral math looks like in Georgia. And then last I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, so so first I have, to, I have to tell you, the day that I met John Lewis, um, was really remarkable. He had agreed to endorse our campaign for Lieutenant Governor 
in 2018. And it was the day of the March for Our Lives. Y'all remember this was in response to the Parkland High School shooting. And um, it was a really emotional and personal issue for me as a mom, two daughters in a public elementary school in Cobb County, Georgia. Uh, it was the day of the annual Easter egg at my brother-in-law's church where he was the pastor. And my kids, uh, you know, also look forward to that with their cousins and, of course, all the candy inside the eggs. But our oldest daughter, who had been reading about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his movement in the civil rights, um, and particularly his friendship with um, Congressman John Lewis, uh, decided she would rather come and mark husband and I than go to the Easter egg hunt with her cousins. And so when I met John Lewis, Oops. We'll try this. Uh, here's uh, we're good. Ah. sorry, guys. My internet connection is not fabulous right now. But so Sophia goes with me to meet Congressman Lewis, and here's one of her heroes. And instead of um, doing the usual photo op, you know, it's nice to meet you. Move on to the next person. The congressman crouched down to eye level to my daughter, who was I think in kindergarten at the time and asked her about her hopes for the future, uh, asked about her dreams. And it's really a remarkable thing, um, you know, to see the care that he took to prepare the next generation. And I think one of the most important things we can do in caring for his legacy um, is do that same thing, share that same message to all voters about the importance. But I love that he did that with a kindergartner, uh, that he took the time out of a line full of people waiting to meet him. And we have some of the best pictures. I'll post them on Twitter later. Um, so let's talk about 2022 elections. Not only would I argue that the electorate favors Democrats in a way that it really didn't when Stacey and I ran in 2018 for the 2022 elections, I would argue that in fact, um, if we're able to turn out our vote, uh, we'll have a much stronger performance even than we did in 2020. So let's be clear, the 2020 elections did not show that Georgia was a purple state. Democrats swept every single statewide election, the presidential ticket and both US Senate seats. Um, this is a year that Democrats can be proud of the turnout efforts we had, but it was the result of a, law, a long time effort by a lot of on the ground organizers and activists and of course Stacey Abrams and in particular the new Georgia project and their ability to register new voters of colors and younger voters in Georgia. Um, the math for 2022 however is even better since the 2020 elections we've actually registered about a quarter million voters and in total about a 1.3 million new Georgians have registered to vote since we ran in 2018. Um, of those 1.3 new, uh, 1.3 million new Georgia voters, about 47% of them are people of color. 31.6% of them are new black voters and 43% of those voters are under age 30. So these are traditionally all demographics cohorts that heavily favor the democratic ticket. Um, in addition, we think about 47% of those are likely Democrat voters, whereas only about 28% are likely Republican voters. So going into this year, we have the advantage of math. Um, and for those of us who love data and analytics, um, that is a tremendous comfort when we look at the stakes, because I think it's not only whether or not Stacey Abrams will become the first black female to be governor in the history of our country, it's also about maintaining um, the Senate. Once again, I think control of the Senate will largely come down to the reelection of uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock in Georgia. And again, we're gonna have these incredibly important congressional races as well. Having said all of that, that's the good news. Um, here are the wild cards at play. Obviously, um, SB 202, which is the voter suppression bill that Republicans and Governor Brian Kemp rammed through the state legislature um, may severely restrict access to the ballot box for many communities that have been traditionally marginalized. And since the Shelby County decision in the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, um, there aren't a lot of cards left to play. So the litigation that's currently moving through the courts right now will be absolutely essential to whether or not all of the people 
who we've been able to register all of that great 1.3 million new voters in the Georgia electorate since the 2018 cycle really all have equitable access to vote. Um, in, within that bill, a lot of people are really focused on things like not being able to hand out water to somebody in line. And yes, that's bad, but really the restriction around um, drop boxes for absentee ballots, the ability for a partisan gerrymandered state legislature controlled by Republicans um, to be able to take over local boards of elections, particularly in Fulton County, DeKalb County, in the city of Atlanta, heavily Democratic, heavily minority areas, um, that's even more concerning. You're really seeing in that aspect of the law, the subversion of the right to vote and the systematic suppression of voters of color. And so I think that's wild card number one. And as Democrats abroad, even though those issues may not affect you in the same way, the most important thing you can do is amplify the messaging, amplify the messaging from groups like the NAACP, the ACLU, Fair Fight Action. Um, make sure people understand what is happening because it's exactly what the New York Times says, right? Democracy dies in darkness. And the more light that you can shine on these issues, the more we, likely we are to be able to overcome them in the spirit of Congressman John Lewis, who overcame really inconceivable obstacles to achieve all that he did in his life. Um, the second wild card I think that we have to watch um, it is really uh, gerrymandering. Somebody brought this up in the chat, but at best right now in the state of Georgia, Republicans might claim they're near 50% of the voters um, based on the 2020 and 2021 elections, at best 50-50 state. Nevertheless, they've created congressional maps that give the Republicans a nine to five advantage in our congressional delegation, um, pitting Congresswoman Lucy McBath against Congresswoman Carolyn Bordeaux. Uh, and, and really, I would say, again, they had to go out of their way to make a map that so poorly reflects the voters of Georgia and the will of the people in Georgia. So again, we're going to be following legislation, not just uh, and litigation, not just in Georgia, but in places like North Carolina, where we have seen some resistance to partisan gerrymandering, um, and in places like Texas and Arizona, where unfortunately these laws have been allowed to proceed with much more impunity. So from a perspective of what you can do from abroad, writing letters to the editor, speaking out on social media, calling and writing your federal representative, and for those of you, I know a lot of folks abroad can only vote on the federal ballot. Please don't let that keep you from voting this year. Again, control of the Senate, um, margins in the House, potentially control of the House will come down to some of these seats and every voice matters. So that's kind of a recap from my perspective of what the math looks like and what the wild cards are that will determine how much Democrats in Georgia can benefit from that robust electorate growth that favors us heavily. Uh, look, these voters matter. Voters of color matter. Black voters matter. If they didn't, Republicans in our state wouldn't be working so hard to suppress their voices. So with that, Evelyn, I'm going to, you know, answer, happy to answer any questions for a few minutes or just say thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you can stick around. We've got um, Representative sure. Williams here and she's on a really tight schedule. So we're going to go over to Katie Sullen to introduce her. And if you've got some time later, we'd love to ask you some questions. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. All right, Katie, I'll hand over to you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Georgia State Team kickoff event. I'm going to make a very short introduction to our wonderful speaker, Congresswoman Nakima Williams. Uh, Nikima served as the chair of the Georgia Democratic Party and after that became the chair of the Democratic Party. We are very, very lucky that she was elected to, to succeed uh, Congressman John Lewis and she is serving in her first term in the US Congress representing Georgia. And that's a short introduction because I know that you and we want to hear from you from her. Nikima, Congressman Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. The microphone is yours. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's morning here in Georgia. I don't know what time it is where you are right now, but it is a Monday morning here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am honored to be here with you today to kick off 
a year of y'all reelecting Democrats up and down the ballot. I am Congresswoman Nakima Williams, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as not only the chairwoman of the Democratic Party of Georgia, but also the Congresswoman for Georgia's 5th Congressional District. As Katie mentioned, my friend Katie, who I've been in the trenches with for years, um, I succeeded our friend and our hero, Congressman John Lewis, in this seat, and it has been nonstop ever since, y'all. So I want to make sure that you have time to get in some of your questions, but I just want you to know how proud I am that Georgians Abroad was one of the first Democrats abroad state teams that was formed, and Georgia Democrats, y'all, we have the history of getting into that good trouble that Congressman Lewis taught us to do, and y'all are carrying on that legacy abroad. And so I know that when we win elections, we win them on the margins. And with the close numbers that we've had in Georgia, we could not have done it without Democrats abroad. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for always showing up and making sure that we are the deciders in these elections. We know that we had a very adventurous 2020 cycle and people told us that there's no way that Georgia was going to deliver its 16 electoral college votes for Joe Biden. But y'all, we did not only that, but then we sent our two US Senate races into a runoff. And at that point, they were like, oh, Nakima, that's cute. You think you're really going to win these runoff elections? You think that Georgia Democrats are going to turn back out to vote in a runoff? And I told them to watch me work. And y'all, we got busy. We contacted our friends abroad. We contacted people in every corner of the state to make sure that we told them exactly what was on the line and reiterated their power in these elections. And y'all showed up in force because we not only won one, but we won two United States Senate seats and changed the trajectory of this country and the makeup of the United States Senate. Now, some of you might be saying there's a lot of stuff that I wish we would have gotten done in this past term in Congress, and I share that frustration with you. But guess what? Our margins were so close and so tight. We did everything that we could. We still passed a transformational infrastructure bill. We still made sure that the House was fighting at every opportunity to stand up for our rights to vote in this country. But what Congressman Lewis taught us is that this journey, this work, is not for a day, for a month, even for a year. We know that we can't give up. We have to keep going. There is still way too much on the line and the work to protect our democracy, to protect our right to vote is worth it. And so we still have work to do. I want to, I just wanted to come on and basically say thank you this morning or this afternoon. Thank you, thank you for being there for us and for everything that you continue to do to uplift the voice of Democrats abroad. And I wanna answer any questions that you might have because y'all, we are in this together. I cannot do it alone. And I appreciate the partnership and y'all being co-conspirators for justice. Thank you so much, Representative Williams. We have a question from our Global Women's Caucus. Sally Schwartz would like to ask you a question. Yes, hi, and thank you for being with us. Hi, Sally. Hi. <laughs> um, I, uh, I chair the Reproductive Justice uh, Action Team within the Global Women's Caucus, and we are incredibly concerned. Um, I'm sure you probably know that Georgia ranks 48th in the nation, 48th in the entire nation for healthcare for women. And the Georgia's abortion ban worse, makes it much worse for all women's health in Georgia. Um, the Dem my, my team has actually geared up a video project, which I put in the uh, chat room, uh, the, the link to it, um, so that people can contribute if they want. What we're doing is we're making videos of anyone that will make us a 60 second video to broadcast on YouTube to help get out the vote for people, uh, and particularly women who are concerned about this tsunami that is killing our rights to control our own body. So my question is, to both of you or just to you, um, what can be done in your opinion to support equality for women in Georgia? 
and to combat all of these state laws, which are killing us, particularly in light of the probable either draft restriction, uh, which the Supreme Court will come down on on Roe versus Wade, or it's total overturn. So thank you for taking the time and I'm glad to see your face. Glad we're in communication. Thank you. So Sally, I'm not sure if you know um, my professional history, but I spent 10 years on the front lines as the vice president of public policy with Planned Parenthood Southeast. And so I was in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi fighting back against some of the most restrictive bans across in the country. And so I, I share your fears and I understand exactly what's at stake. We have passed the Women's Health Protection Act in the House. And so that bill is lingering in the Senate, along with so many other bills that would really protect fundamental rights in this country. We're counting on the United States Senate. And so that's why we have to look at, you gotta tell your friends who might be registered to vote in other states other than Georgia, but living abroad, that we need them to show up as well. We need to get people like Val Demings elected to the United States Senate in Florida. We need to get people elected all across the country because we have to have better margins in the US Senate. This is um, something that has been on my mind consistently. I am tomorrow night, we have our an annual um, Roses for Row event here in Atlanta. And I'll be going to that to talk with um, our Planned Parenthood leaders here in Georgia about our next steps. Unfortunately, we have seen what happens when we don't, when we only focus on the federal level. And we have to also make sure that we're looking at the state level as well. And so we cannot forget in the grand scheme of things, our state legislative races, because that's where all of these restrictions are coming from. And I came from the state Senate and I was there when the abortion ban passed on the state Senate floor here in Georgia. And we did everything that we could to push back against it, but the numbers were just stacked against us. So at the end of the day, it's a numbers game because everyone is so focused instead of on the real protection and health of women in this country, but on what they can do to appease their party and the Republican party will do everything that they can to overturn Roe versus Wade. At one point I thought, that that was not the case, that this was just political posturing, but now it's actually happening. And so we have to make sure that we are focused on every level of government to make sure that what happened in Texas does not happen across all across the country. I took a, um, I went on a delegation trip with some other state legislative colleagues to El Salvador, where it is the only country that actually jails women for having abortions right now. And I met with those women in prison and told them that I was going to remember their stories when people wanted to talk about the hypotheticals of what could happen if we banned abortion in this country, because it's not just a hypothetical. I've seen it with my own eyes of what can happen when people are, when women are jailed for miscarriages, jailed for abortions, serving life prison sentences in El Salvador right now, there are still 12 women in prison. And so we have to make sure that we are not allowing this to happen. And it's gonna take organizing on the ground. It's gonna take reaching out to people who are unlikely allies to make sure that we are uplifting and telling the stories of the people that would be impacted by these abortion bans. And so I'm not giving up. Um, I went into Mississippi in 2011 and led the campaign to stop the personhood ballot initiative. And everybody told me that that couldn't be done, Sally, and we got it done. So I'm not one to give up easily. When people tell me what can't be done, I remind them of the words of Nelson Man Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's done. So I am going to be counting on y'all to help continue to do this work and uplift our voices in this fight for freedom. Thank you very much. And please tell everyone you know, everyone, contact your senators. The Women's Health Protection Act is coming to a vote on, on the Senate floor on February 28th. That's the crucial date we're looking at right now. Thank you very much, Nikima and Jennifer and everyone else. Thank you. Thanks so much for your work that you're doing, Sally. And thank you so much, Representative Williams, for that passionate answer. And we really appreciate everything that you're doing to fight for women's reproductive justice. I'm not sure how much time you have. We do have a couple more questions, but we wanna be respectful of your time. Could you take one more question? And I know that Sarah is on too. Sarah um, Riggs-Amico is still on, and I didn't know if she wanted to chime in on this. 
Sarah, don't want to call you out, but saw you in the chat box. No, it's fine. Um, so for me, uh, look, first and foremost, um, Nakima has been a huge leader on both issues, voting rights that we have in the chat and reproductive justice in Georgia for a long time. And, and in fact, she and I have had a lot of conversations as I sort of understood how I could be a better advocate on um, not just ab abortion access and rights, but also on the actual full scope of reproductive justice, making sure that every parent has the right to raise their child in a safe and secure environment. Um, and, and that the color of your skin or the happenstance of your zip code doesn't determine access to that. So first and foremost, it's good to see you, Nakima, and thank you for everything. On the voting rights piece, I think um, really the best thing that we can do is get the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act passed. Um, but we also have to think about uh, the infrastructure that Republicans are trying to set up in uh, for the 2024 election, where what they tried, which was effectively a coup in 2020, um, they're trying to give it a second go. And if we're not paying attention in the midterms to things like Secretary of State's elections, to taking, as Nakima said, a better margin in the US Senate where we can ensure that the democratic institutions that allow us to have a republic remain in place, we're going to have a, a very difficult time in 2024. So don't take your eye off the ball because it's the midterms. Nakima needs votes uh, in the Senate to help the work she's doing in the House. The House needs to maintain their democratic majority. And the only way we can do that is by getting some of those 80 or 90% of the voters abroad that Evelyn mentioned to register and show up for our candidates. Um, we're gonna need to do that everywhere from Georgia to Arizona and anywhere in between. Uh, so that, that's sort of my take is right now, we've, we've seen the cards on the table with the representation that we have and it's not enough. We need more. We need more US senators from the Democratic Party. We need more Democratic secretaries of state across this country, more Democratic attorney generals, and we need more people like Nakima serving in the U.S. House. So, Nakima, I don't know if that answers the question fully, but but that's sort of my take on on where we are. And certainly codifying Roe, uh, someone put in the chat, call your senators. Yes, please. Um, making sure that we're actually going up. Um, uh, you know, to, to where this is not going to be subject to political whims, but where my daughters will control their own bodies, no matter who is in office, is fundamental to having the kind of society we want to live in. And what I will say is, I know that there are probably a lot of other questions that you guys want to talk about, but y'all literally any issue that you can think about comes back to the fundamental right to vote the fundamentals of our democracy. So whether it is climate action that you want to advocate for, whether it is reproductive freedom, no matter what the issue is that you are most concerned about, until we make sure that we have that fundamental right to vote secured, then we are still going to have an uphill battle. So it all comes back to the foundations of our democracy. So I appreciate you for leading with this on what would have been Congressman John Lewis's 82nd birthday and it kicking off this charge and making sure that we are laser focused on what's important in these midterm elections. Mm -hmm. okay. We've got one last question from Evelyn from our Georgia State team lead. I'll hand over to yes. her. Yes. Um, I wanted to know uh, about Senator Warnock. He's uh, on the ticket this, uh, this election. And uh, what do you think are his chances for keeping the seat? Uh, he's an important moral voice, as Sarah called him. Uh, what is your opinion? So I am proud to call Senator Warnock not only my United States Senator, but a constituent. He lives here in the mighty fighting 5th Congressional District. And y'all, I watch him on the floor in the Senate. I watch the work that he's doing, not just Democratic work, but he's doing work in a bipartisan way. And I will tell anyone that I don't seek out bipartisan legislation. I seek out legislation that is truly going to impact and advance the, the rights of people that I serve in my district. And if it happens to be bipartisan, so be it. And Senator Warnock has hit the ground running and has been all over the state reminding Georgians of how he has delivered for them in just one year. It's only been one year. So imagine what we can get if we elect him to a full term. He has outraised his opponent. He actually lives in the state of Georgia, unlike his opponent who lives in Texas. 
And he is actually representative of the people of the state and willing to talk with everyone, regardless of their partisanship or their ideals, because he knows that that's what service is about. And so I know that while we shouldn't have to out-organize our way out of voter suppression and election subversion, we're up against a lot this election cycle. So Senator Warnock is doing everything that he can in this periwinkle state because we prove that we have the votes here and that what is possible, but we have to make sure we turn our voters back out. And then we have to make sure that we're doing our part at the Democratic Party of Georgia to make sure that every one of those votes are counted when they are returned. So y'all have my word that I am going to be there at every step of the way, making sure that all of our votes get counted. And Senator Warnock is doing his part to continue to tell the story of how he's delivering all across the state for not just Democrats, but for Georgians. Thank you so much. Do you have any special call to action for Georgians living abroad as your, as your final words to us? Anything that you'd like to encourage us to do? What can we do to help you back home? So y'all, we need you all to stay engaged. And I know that I don't have to tell you that because you're the true believers if you're on the Zoom today. But we have to make sure that even with these new election laws that we are continuing to educate voters on what's at stake and what changes went into effect. I know that I've never felt more proud to be a Georgia Democrat. Y'all, we have a chance to make history again and wake up on the morning after the November election knowing that we sent Reverend Warnock back to the U.S. Senate for a full six-year term with our Democratic governor because, y'all, we have some more history to make here in Georgia. So we're going to get make sure that we are talking to voters in every corner of the state and every corner of this country. If you vote in Georgia, I want to hear from you. I want to make sure that you have everything that you need to get your ballot turned back in. So if there is anything that we can do at the Democratic Party of Georgia, please don't hesitate to reach out to us so that we can continue to amplify your voice, amplify your message so that we can reach the masses because every vote counts. Um, I'm being told to unmute myself, so I guess I get to thank you, Nikima. It has been such an honor and privilege to have us, to have you with us today and quite inspiring. Although um, we're celebrating John Lewis's birthday today, of course, there is a, there's a great sadness at losing him after the many, many years of leadership, but uh, what a great joy to have you sitting in his seat and leading us forward. We are with you from abroad. We're gonna turn out more votes than ever before in this midterm. And together, we're gonna to keep Georgia blue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Katie, did you wanna say a couple more words about Representative Williams? Well, I would have if the, sorry about that little kerfluffle everyone because we didn't get the bio on my screen as I was introducing her. So I'm really happy that she mentioned these very important points. The 10 years with Planned Parenthood, which was her life um, before she came to be vice chair and chair of the uh, Georgia Democratic Party. I think that overlapped with her being a state senator, but we will put a link in the box to her bio once we find it, uh, just to know that she really has been, you know, an advocate for social justice and women and families her entire career. And when the mic was thrown to me, I just got this picture of her when I first met her, when she was vice chair of the Georgia Democratic Party and I was chair of Democrats Abroad, and she was very, very, very pregnant with Carter, her seven-year-old son, who's named for the president, I think. And then the other thought that came to mind was in 2014, when she was vice chair and DeBose Porter was chair, Georgia's one of the first uh, state parties that Democrats Broad ever worked with. And in that year, we did a lot of work with them. We did the legwork designing a postal mailer and some other outreach to Georgia's abroad for the first time. Um, with the state party and 
we did the work. We signed a joint, uh, designed and signed a great postal mailer. And uh, it was signed by DeBose Porter, the then chair, and me. And it went out to thousands of Georgian voters abroad, our first joint effort. And they paid all the bills for printing and postage and the rest. So it was a great, um, great partnership. And from then on, uh, the Georgia Democratic Party has really been an advocate for overseas voters and for us. In fact, they've publicly called us their secret weapon. Um, and at that time, they were telling everyone at the DNC and the ASDC that they were on the path to turning Georgia blue and not everyone was believing them. And look what they and we did. We did it in 2021, we did it in 2020, and we need to do it again in 2022. And we will find a great bio and put the link in the chat. Do that. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you for connecting us with Representative Williams. Now we're going to turn over to our Global Youth Caucus. Take it away, Miguel. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Democrats Abroad is so proud to have such a distinguished guest as Eduardo Aviles with, here, with us today. Before I pass it out over to Mr. Aviles, uh, and in keeping with John Lewis's legacy, I'd like to reflect about the Peach State for a little bit. My name is Miguel Madrigal of Democrats Abroad Costa Rica, and I'm the chair of the Democrats Abroad Youth Caucus. Um, in 2020 and 2021, I went down to Georgia, and boy, do I have a story to tell. As we celebrated a well-deserved victory in November 2020, where overseas voters made the margin of victory for Biden in Georgia, something was steering up again there. And after the dust settled, there were still two US Senate seats up for grabs. Republican Senators Kelly Leffler and David Perdue were running for reelection against Democratic challengers, Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. Um, Georgia state law requires uh, that the winner capture a majority of the votes in the November election. Otherwise, a runoff election is to be held two months later. Uh, the Democratic Party needed to win both U.S. Senate seats to gain control of the chamber. And to make things worse, the last time a Democrat won a U.S. Senate seat was Zell Miller way back in the year 2000 when I was only five years old. With stakes so high, I couldn't stand there and do nothing. While fe fellow Democrats abroad volunteers were GOTVing overseas, I started looking on the internet and found out about this fantastic organization called Seed the Vote that pairs volunteers with grassroots, grassroots groups on the ground. And I immediately applied, and before I knew it, I took a mid midnight flight to Georgia and joined Mi Gente and Unite Here to, to knock on as many doors as I could. Over the course of a week and a half, I knocked on roughly 500 doors spread out in Cobb, Clark, DeKalb, Forsyth, Fulton, Gwinnett, and Whitfield counties. While I knocked on doors, I cannot tell you how grateful people were with us, especially young people. They were mostly surprised to see somebody as young as them working on a, another boring political campaign. <clears throat> whenever we, when, and whenever I could, I would tell voters my story. This kid came all the way from Costa Rica to encourage them to go vote. As most of you know, Democrats succeeded in winning both Senate seats. Now let's not be fooled by these dual victories in 2021. Georgia is far from a slam dunk for the Democrats. Among other things, um, we need to reelect Senator Raphael Warnock to keep hold of the US Senate and hopefully expand a majority. Yes, door by door, person by person and heart by heart, we proved Georgia can bend the moral arc of history towards justice. Now, let's not forget that this time the stakes are higher and we have to work even harder, both from abroad and in the United States to win in 2022. Now, if there's one thing you have to take away from this soapbox speech is that voters across the board, including, including minority and young voters, can be educated and can be mobilized. So let's keep Georgia on our minds do the work and win the midterms. Now, uh, let me introduce uh, Eduardo Aviles. Eduardo was born in LA, California, and he moved to Atlanta, Georgia with the rest of his family when he was only three years, three years old. He graduated with a bachelor's degree 
from in political science from Georgia State University in 2016, and a master's degree in political science from with a concentration in professional politics, also from Georgia State in 2018. He currently works for a PAC that supports Democratic candidates doing research. Um, he is a national committee man for the Young Democrats of Georgia and region representative for the to the International Committee of Young Democrats of America. Um, he has also worked at his state uh, at his state legislature. He interned for an organization that champions civic engagement for the, in the Latino community and worked on campaigns to help elect public servants that want to work for their people. He plans to use his education and the experience uh, he has gained to improve communities for everyone. ¿Cómo está, Eddie? ¿Cómo, cómo se encuentra? Gracias, Miguel, por esa introducción. Muchas gracias. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, it was amazing hearing Congresswoman the King Williams speak. It was fantastic. All the speakers were just amazing. And I got to tell you, I'm a little bit uh, excited and invigorated uh, for what's coming up. So a little bit about what I do. Um, I am, as I, I was mentioned in my introduction, I am the National Committee Rep for the Young Democrats of Georgia. What that means is I represent the Young Democrats of Georgia to the national level, which is the Young Democrats of America, and bring resources down from the, from the national level to the state level to help us continue the work we're doing. I also hold a couple of seats in the Young Democrats of America, uh, Secretary for our committee, and then uh, Region Rep for the International Committee, which is sort of how I got involved with Democrats abroad, uh, or you know, meeting them and getting to know them. Um, and more, most recently, I, I work for a PAC that supports Democratic candidates and wants to hold Republicans accountable. My work consists of me keeping tabs on Republican candidates um, electronically, on social media, in person, and making sure that people are aware of what they're saying. By that, I mean, if they post a video on Facebook uh, to their followers saying something, I capture that video and I write a report and I put it out. Uh, I go to events in person where they have rallies, fundraisers, meet and greets, and um, write a report after that as well. This past weekend, I have been at several events for our candidates from all up and down the ticket, from governor to senators to Secretary of State. So I am really immersed in Republican uh, candidates and their followers right now. But what I do on the Young Democrat side is I help get young Democratic Georgia voters out. And to sort of combat this, I think I saw a comment in the, um, the chat before I came on that caught my eye. Um, engaging the empathetic youth from Dan Smith. Um, it may seem like there is some apathy from uh, younger generations, but I tell you, these college Democrats and these high school Democrats in 2020, they came out in force. They helped us with all of our projects. And like I said, we were up late writing grant requests, writing out um, texts to send out to voters trying to get the base out to vote in 2020, and it continued into the 2021 runoffs. So yes, there may be some apathy, but I'll tell you, that's changing, that's changing fast. And I am very happy to be part of that work um, to get them engaged, because I can't be a young Democrat forever. <laughs> I'm gonna age out eventually. So I would like for more people to get involved so work continues and carries on. Um, I will mention as part of the work I do for the PAC, the candidates, a large portion of their message is, we won the election, but something went wrong and you need to fix it. I hear that so many times. And what shocks me even more than that is that the attendees, they believe it. They believe they won, but it was stolen. And that, that is not okay. So I think the work that we're all doing is very important. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone here for everything they're doing because this all matters. Um, so that was a bit about the work I do. I, 
I am happy to take some questions in case anyone wants to know a little bit more detail. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be here. To hear from everyone. Well, uh, Eddie, I do have a question for you. Um, when I was in Georgia, I knocked on many doors, especially in the Hispanic community. Um, what challenges do you think the Hispanic community will have to turn out in Georgia in this coming midterm election? Well, you mentioned that, and I've had my own experiences with knocking in uh, or canvassing in Hispanic communities. Um, one of the organizations I worked for, uh, they were focused on uh, Latinos in the community. And we walk in pairs, and um, I noticed I got a warmer reception at the door because I was able to speak to them in their language than my partner, who, um, well, didn't, and didn't, didn't look like them. And during that time, there was a heightened fear of, you know, ice. I was coming to people's doors and taking their family members away. So I completely understood the, uh, the hesitation to talk to someone that you didn't know. So I think in that coupled with this targeting that the GOP is doing, because like I mentioned, I was at an event this past Saturday, an election integrity summit, where they're focused on getting minority voters to their side to win. And their message is they're all conservative voters that just don't know it. So I think those two things are, are, are what we need to focus on. You know, we need to let them know that one, their vote counts, it matters, they need to come out. And if it takes people that they feel warmer to, to get out, we need to send those people out. And two, to be aware of any misinformation that comes out because it's out there and is being targeted at these communities. Okay, great. I, I do have a question from Teresa. Teresa, go ahead. Yes, hello, Eddie. Thank you so much for all you're doing for speaking with us. I would like to know um, how uh, YDA is connected to the various um, movement activities of March for Our Lives. Mm, I don't exactly know what work um, YDA is doing with March for Our Lives or Sunrise Movement. I do know that you know, YDA is a large national organization. There are many committees, many caucuses, and many chairs, and many positions that people hold. So um, just because I'm not aware of an event that are being partnered with doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just um, it's something I thought might hurt you. Uh, but at the moment, I am not aware of any, anything going on in my, you know, in my area. Because I, if I just might add, because since the 2020 election, we have another 8 million kids who turned 18. And of course, that would be a marvelous margin. And also that will be 16 million by the time we get to 2024. And I would hate to see their amazing energy. I was crying every day with the, everything that the kids were doing. I was just so full of promise and hope for the future because of their incredible reaction and activism. And so I would hate to see it fall through the cracks. Thank you for taking my question. No, I agree, and I would like to you know, add a little bit more to that. Um, just like YDG has a college caucus, a high school caucus that is just out there doing the work, YDA has the same national caucus that um, all the other uh, statewide chapters fall into, and they are always working. There's always something going on with them. Uh, I'll make a note here and I'll pass it on along to the chair there, just you know, in case they don't know these movements. I'm pretty sure they do, but just in case they don't. I'll pass it along so they're aware and they get to work on getting the partnership set up. Thank you so much. It might even be really helpful financially, you know, pooling, pooling your efforts and resources. Thank you. I see Eleanor from Atlanta, Toronto. Go ahead, Eleanor. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, and thank you so much, Eddie, for speaking with us. So when we talk about things like we need democratic senators, we need democratic attorney generals, secretaries of state. Um, anecdotally, what I've observed as a young person, you know, working to register young voters in Israel in the 2016 election in Canada in 2020, um, I've noticed there's so much passion about federal elections and presidential races, 
but there doesn't seem to be the same level of awareness with our state and municip municipal elections. So I wanna know, are there any messages you have noticed that particularly res resonate with young people about getting them to vote and turn out more on these um, midterm elections and other elections versus you know the federal like big elections? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I was, I was actually talking about this with uh, a colleague the other day, but 2016, 2020 sort of changed how we, you know, how politics works for a lot of people. Um, I would certainly agree that prior to that, there was some lack of interest or engagement amongst young voters, but due to what's been happening these past uh, couple of years, that's, I, we see that's rapidly changing. Our membership is growing within YDG. Um, at the previous two conventions have had more people, there's more interested positions. So I think the message is out there. You know, you know things are things are not the way they should be. People want to get engaged. They want to know how. So I think yes, the message is important. Come and come and join us. But also the how. That's a big question that I get. You know, what can I do? How can I go about this? And there are a ton of organizations working out there to get people involved to run for something. That's actually an organization run for something. There's Merge. There is a bunch of organizations out there that want people. We just have to connect them. So what we do is, you know, we whenever we hear how do you know how do I get involved? Perfect. Here are these organizations. New American leaders. They're targeting Georgia. Run for something. They're out here, and you know, get involved with talk to them and they'll help you set you up. So I think just making those connections and letting them know, hey, there's a space for you, come on in, that's fantastic. And we have one final question from Sue Alxenis from Democrats Abroad Canada. Go ahead, Sue. Oh, hi. Thank you, Eddie, for being with us. We appreciate it, appreciate it so much. I put my question in the chat. Um, it basically uh, just that the Progressive Caucus uh, in DA recently hosted an event on um, the corrupt student loan uh, system in the US. And I was wondering what efforts were under underway among the young Dems in Georgia, uh, or national or perhaps the national YDA on reform of the um, really terrible system and forgiveness of student loans. Certainly, that would help to reduce some of the um, apathy that may be out there among young potential voters. Yeah, um, as someone with student loans, trust me, this is, this is an issue that is very near and dear to me and I keep up with it as much as I can. Um, at the beginning of, I wanna say last year, we had within YDA something called the Biden test. Um, it was a group of people from different states uh, that would come together and you know, put our issues together and we presented to someone from um, Biden's team. Um, one of the big issues that came up was student loans. Unfortunately, that um, they didn't go very far, uh, as we've seen, and sort of installed. Uh, we have sent out letters. Um, one, one recent letter we sent out was to Senator Manchin back um, a couple of months ago, encouraging him to come to the table. That didn't pan out, you know. There's only so much we can do if, if they don't listen. I mean, we continue to work, we continue to contact them, but unfortunately, right now, it doesn't seem like it's gonna go very far, but you know, we're not gonna give up. We're gonna continue writing letters, we're gonna continue talking to people until something happens. But as, as of right now, that's what I think where we're at. Thanks for trying. We we know we learned we learned that it's a bipartisan problem that the Democrats aren't consistently really on top of um, what this what this uh, corrupt system is all about. So hopefully we can get a potentially a bipartisan solution. Thanks for your work. Thank you, sir. And uh, I think Katie Solon would like to speak. So Katie, I will before we. Um, we finish, I, I would like to thank Eddie. Muchas gracias for being here. We do appreciate your work with, with the Georgia State uh, team. Um, and I, did you attend Georgia State University? Is, are those the Bulldogs in Athens or am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we are the Panthers. I, I would love for my college to oh, have oh. A, uh, a national trophy, but unfortunately they don't. <laughs> 
Um, I guess that's it for me. I just want to thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to hit the road now because they don't stop working and neither do we. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much. Hi, Miguel, am I now on? My mic just got unmuted, unmuted again. <laughs> Go ahead, Katie. It's all yeah. of you. I just wanted to follow up Eleanor's excellent question and Jennifer's excellent answer in the chat box. Um, I was about to say I'm sitting in Arizona. I'm not, I'm in New Mexico next door, but I was in Arizona during the, um, the 2020 election. And I worked for a number of state and local candidates. There was so much energy uh, in Arizona and so much hope and so much hard work. We thought the down ballot candidates were raising so much enthusiasm, they were gonna help up ballot. They were gonna help elect Biden and Kelly. Well, as you know, from Arizona, Biden and Kelly made it and we lost everything down ballot. We lost nearly every critical important race. And that happened around the country. I think it happened in Georgia as well. And it happened because we were not voting down ballot. And that's a big we, that's Democrats all over, but it's overseas voters and Democrats abroad. So I just wanted to emphasize again, if you can vote down ballot and you live overseas, do it. If you need to find out about the candidates, it's easy to do on the internet or um, ask us. But please get the full ballot if you can. And if you get it, vote down ballot critical decisions that affect all of us, including overseas voters, happen by the people who are holding those state and local races. So please, um, everybody out there, vote the full ballot if you can and get involved in uh, the party and issues groups and candidate campaigns, both at the national level and at the state and local. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I will give it back to Jennifer. Jennifer, you're the moderator. I don't know why I'm, I'm moderating, so go ahead. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eddie. And we, not Eddie. Thanks so much, Mika. We really appreciate all that you did on the ground in Georgia. That was great to hear your story. And we really appreciate everything that the Youth Caucus, the Global Youth Caucus is doing to help turn out the vote of our young people. And it's so important, the work that you're doing. We really appreciate it. Let us let us know if there's anything that we can do as the state teams to work together to partner with you. And we're so glad that you could be here with us today. Appreciate it. Awesome. I'm gonna hand back over to Evelyn. And we do still have Sarah on the call if we have a last couple of questions for her. And then we'll wrap up our recording and that we can open it up to some voting questions here at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I wanted to make reference to Katie's call to people voting down ballot. Um, that's, that's, there was a discussion here in the chat. That's a little bit uh, difficult, but I will say that um, uh, Heidi Birch, who is with uh, Vote From Abroad and is sort of our expert on all things voting, simply says, uh, vote uh, the ballot that you get. So even if you say you do not intend to return and you get a full ballot, you can vote on that ballot. You can vote down ballot. Uh, because it's a secret ballot. So nobody will check to see if you checked on your federal postcard or application that you, your, un, your return is uncertain. Uh, I think that's an important message because I also doubted, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm a person who says I, my return is uncertain. Um, and um, I, I thought that was very helpful information to say, okay, if, if your local election office sends you a full ballot, then you can vote that ballot because your ballot is secret. Uh, otherwise, I would recommend really looking at your situation, finding out how Georgia, Georgia has a, a state income tax. So you need to know, um, you know, if you are considered a state tax resident in Georgia or not, if you want to vote down ballot. That's something that only a tax consultant or the tax office in Georgia can help you define. That's something that we can't do, but just like a word of warning, but we're concentrating on the, um, on the midterms. And I got a full ballot last time for the, for, the, uh, for the November election, even though I said I did not intend or, or my return was uncertain. So whatever ballot you get, you vote what you can. Okay, 
So thank you. That's it. Awesome. Um, Sherry, I see that you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask another question? Sure. Thanks so much for taking um, my question. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Georgia State team. I do vote in Massachusetts, but I think it's so important. I help to uh, make calls into Georgia during the runoffs. And uh, oh, my goodness, I'm so glad the two senators won. I just happen to be on a vacation at the moment. I live in uh, Toronto. But I'm down in the Bahamas after two years of being locked down in Canada. And I've been speaking to a few Americans here and they have no idea that Democrats abroad exists. So my suggestion is if at all possible for Democrats abroad is to get the word out in the states and small newspapers to Tell, let friends and family know that we exist and so that their friends and family can vote abroad. I, I think that's so important. And uh, especially for, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, I know you're probably doing this already, Miguel, students uh, going to school abroad. But I think that's, I don't know how much you promote this right now, but I, I think it's really important. Thank you for taking my suggestion. That is really one of the key reasons that we are here with our state teams is to create these partnerships back home so that we can get out the word that Democrats can vote from abroad. Um, and we've got Sarah on the line still. And Sarah, if you would like to finish off for us, maybe you've got a call to action for us Democrats abroad and Georgians abroad. If you've got a couple more minutes to... Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry for the background noise. As I said, I'm on spring break with my kids and they have insisted we move to the pool. So um, <laughs> all I can say is we should take that very festive atmosphere and feeling into the 2022 midterms. Guys, these races are all winnable. And as I think about the future, um, you know, our kids are going to live in the world we vote for. Just think about that. Uh, for those of you on the continent, um, you know, my family is in Italy. Um, my husband's family is all still there. Our kids are both Italian and American. Um, think of what's happening on the continent right now and think of how different that would be if Joe Biden had not won the 2020 election. Um, there's not a day that goes by where I don't thank God for the outcome in 2020. And that's what you're voting for. That's what you're gonna tell your friends and family about. So my, my call to action, Jennifer, would be each of you make a commitment between now and the spring um, that you're going to find three to five Dem Democrats abroad, uh, help register them to vote. And, and again, it's, it's not just about us, guys. It's the world they're going to live in. That's what you're voting for. And that's what we can chart a course for this year. Awesome. Perfect words to finish with. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you thank for you, this connection to Democrats Abroad. And we thank really you. appreciate everything that you're doing and we look forward to working together in the future. Anytime, grateful for all of y'all. Y'all make a difference, seriously. I'm so grateful, especially as a Georgian with two daughters. So thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the time at the pool, enjoy your break. <laughs> all right. Bye. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks everyone for coming today. We will end our recording now and um, we'll stay online if in case you have some voting questions or you'd like to ask anything else, but we'll go ahead and, um, and end our recording. And